In this episode of Plants of the Gods, Dr. Mark Plotkin will continue discussing peyote, this time through the lens of his mentor, none other than father of ethnobotany himself, Richard Evans Schultes. From an undergraduate term paper that started it all to an adventure in the plains of Oklahoma, we'll learn how Schultes' experiences and encounters with peyote influenced his research and directed his career. Today, I want to talk about my mentor, Richard Evan Schultes, and his research on peyote and the effect that peyote had on him and his career. But let me talk a little bit about what kind of a person Schultes was and how his reputation preceded him in the most remote depths of the Amazon forest. In the early 1980s, I was researching the hallucinogenic snuffs of the northern Amazon. Schultes had also worked there, studying the effects of the snuffs on the Brazil side of the Venezuelan border. I wanted to complement his research by investigating the snuffs to the north on the Venezuelan side. There was a very, very, very remote Yanomamo village that was inhabited by dozens of Yanomamos and by an anthropologist who had lived with them for many years. However, I'd been warned and warned repeatedly that this anthropologist had somehow sort of gone native in a sort of heart of darkness kind of way, and that outsiders had gone in there and never come back. I chalked this up to the types of rumors and nonsense that often emanates from remote corners of the world, and being in my late 20s, I felt rather invulnerable. So I went in to see what I could find. After several days travel through the rainforest, I arrived at the village, which was a Yanomami roundhouse known as a Shabano. I found the anthropologist living in a hut next door to the indigenous roundhouse. When I arrived, he greeted me pleasantly, but a bit formally, and asked why I was there. I told him that I was an ethnobotanist, that I was a student, that I was interested in learning about the magic snuffs of the local people, and that I was there as a student of Richard Evan Schultes. As soon as I mentioned this name, his demeanor completely changed. He broke into a big smile and said, If you're a student of Schultes, you're certainly welcome here. Schultes, in fact, began his lifelong career devoted to documenting and understanding the plants of the gods by studying peyote. As an undergraduate, he had enrolled in a class at Harvard, an undergraduate class called Plants and Human Affairs, Bio 104. This was a famous class taken by many people who went into ethnobotany. And ironically, when Schultes came back from the Amazon many, many, many years later, he ended up teaching the class himself. Schultes told me that he was the only work-study student in the class. Most of his classmates were very wealthy guys, which comprised most of the Harvard student body at that time. The professor of the class, the leader of the class, was a botanist by the name of Oakes Ames, the director of the Botanical Museum and a leading authority on orchids. One day in class, Ames told the students that as part of their assignment, they needed to write a term paper, and each term paper must be based on an important plant. And at the back of the classroom was a shelf of books, each of which was devoted to a particular important plant. Schultes, being the work-study student with the least free time, rushed to the back of the classroom and grabbed the shortest book. The book was entitled... Mezcal, The Divine Plant and Its Psychological Effects, written by German psychiatrist Heinrich Kluver. Schultes took the book home with him to East Boston, and when he read about the incredible hallucinations, the incredible visions induced by this humble little cactus, he was inspired to study it further. His term paper was superb, so much so that Professor Oakes Ames reached into his own pocket and paid for Schultes to travel west to visit the Kiowa and other tribal peoples in Oklahoma. Accompanying Schultes was another student, actually a graduate student from Yale, Weston Labar, who went on to have his own illustrious career as an anthropologist. Schultes told me, that after one night in the teepee with the Kiowas, in a ceremony led by the Kiowa roadman, taking peyote around the sacred fire, that he, Schultes, was lost to medical science forever, deciding to pursue a career on the path of hallucinogenic plants and how they could benefit humanity. And it was peyote that set him on that path. In 1936... Schultes headed to Oklahoma on the greatest adventure of his young life. He and Labar 
driving a beat-up old Studebaker, drove across the country on what they labeled uh, somewhat presumptuously as the Harvard Yale Expedition. They arrived in the Kiowa community of Anadarko on June 24th. The Kiowa were originally a tribe of hunter-gatherers who migrated from western Montana to the southern plains in the early 18th century. They were expert horsemen and fearsome warriors and enjoyed democratic forms of governance. However, a treaty signed in 1867 forced them to settle on a reservation in southwestern Oklahoma, lands soon overrun by settlers. Conflicts over these lands led to the imprisonment of many indigenous leaders who resisted the invasion. The Kaya were further weakened by the extermination of their main source of food, the American bison, better known as the buffalo. At the end of the 19th century, the Kiowas planned to observe a sun dance, but were not allowed to conduct the ceremony by the Indian agent of the American government, at which point the ritual of the sun dance was supplanted by the introduction of peyote, which gradually became their most important sacrament. Schultes and Labar's main local contacts in Anadarko were Charlie Apicom, better known as Charlie Charcoal, a local Kiowa leader. Over the course of the summer, Schultes and Labar visited 15 local tribes, not just the Kiowa, but also the Kickapoo, the, the Kapaw, the Shawnee, and the Wichita. During these travels, Schultes and Labar typically ingested peyote two to three times a week. And as I said in the previous episode, peyote is a small green spineless cactus which measures less than six inches in length. It grows in low clumps, usually in scrub desert lands, and prefers soil located near limestone hills. The top of the peyote cactus is known as the crown, and it's when these crowns are cut off and dried that they're known as mescal buttons, hence the name mescaline, the most important and most common alkaloid found within the cactus. Peyote is a rare and slow-growing plant, and it's found only in the Rio Grande version of southwestern Texas and then further south into Mexico. Today, the cactus is the focus of an elaborate religious ceremony practiced by more than 30 American indigenous groups whose territories extend as far north as Canada and as far south as Mexico. Peyote's use as a sacrament extends at least 6,000 years back in time. Schultes described the peyote ceremonies he witnessed in his 1937 paper, Peyote and Plants Used in the Peyote Ceremony, as well as his 1938 paper, The Appeal of Peyote as a Medicine. The ceremonies in which Schultes and Labar participated were led by a roadman, the local term for a traditional healer or shaman, and took place within a large teepee. The roadmen prepared a fire in the hearth, carefully selecting slow-burning species of wood. They adorned themselves with a sash of red or yellowish mezcal beads hung over the left shoulder and across the chest. Now, mezcal beads should not be uh, confused with peyote. Mezcal beads come from a legume known as Sephora secundiflora. The older leaders painted their face using a variety of berries, roots, and earth, each tribe and region having unique patterns and materials. The ceremony begins with a prayer for which each member rolls and smokes a cigarette. The tobacco is kept in a cotton bag which is passed around the circle of worshipers. The cigarettes are never rolled in paper. The use of corn shucks or the leaf of the blackjack oak are used for this purpose which is more in keeping with the old tradition, which the peyote cult members strive to preserve. The cigarette is lighted from a glowing smokestick of cottonwood. Peyote and a cigarette may be called for at any time during the night unless some special rite, such as midnight water, is in progress. When the bag of mezcal buttons has made its first circuit, the leader begins to sing, shaking for accompaniment with his right hand, a gourd rattle. A companion beats time on a small kettle drum made from an iron pat covered with buckskin. The drumstick is usually made of maple, but the finest ones are of true South American mahogany. Each male worshiper sings four songs and passes the instruments on to his neighbor. 
together with the musical instruments, are used a staff made of bois d'arc, or Osage orange, and a fan of eagle or pheasant feathers. The staff is held upright in front of the singer, with the feathers of the fan hiding his face. A spring of sage that was started on its round from the leader's place is usually held with the fan. In the ceremony, peyote is eaten dry, but occasionally fresh plants are consumed. They possess a very bitter taste, but in spite of these, they're chewed and swallowed in great number by participants. The smallest consumption by a single person is about two to four buttons at each meeting. It's impossible to estimate the largest, but I've seen an Indian eat more than 30 in one ceremony. Other investigators report doses as large as 90 buttons. An estimate of the average consumption, however, would probably be about 12 buttons by each person in a single ceremony. As the peyote begins to take effect, Schultes describes two broad phases of intoxication. A period of contentment and oversensitivity, and a period of nervous calm and muscular sluggishness, colored visual hallucinations, and abnormal synesthesia which is the mingling of the senses, alterations in tactile sensation, very slight muscular incoordination, disturbances in space and time perception, and auditory hallucinations may accompany severe peyote intoxication. The most striking characteristic, however, is the induced peyote visions, which are often fantastically colored. Now, this is... um, uh, interesting point for students of ethnobotany. Schultes was famous for telling people he never really saw anything. He never really got off. He really n- never tripped with any of the hallucinogens he imbibed. And this is proof, this, the, the, this paragraph that I just cited is proof that of course he saw things. Of course he had hallucinations and visions and things like this. Schultes was a bit of a trickster. And I mean that in the most positive shamanic sense that he just like to keep people a little off balance on on many occasions. And if you listen to the ayahuasca episode that kicks off season one, I talk about the documentation of him having extraordinary visions and extraordinary experiences under the influence of ayahuasca the very first time uh, that he was able to take it in the Sibandoy Valley of Colombia. Now, according to Schultes, peyote is employed by indigenous peoples in the treatment of tuberculosis, pneumonia, influenza, colds, gastrointestinal ailments, scarlet fever, diabetes, rheumatic pains, venereal disease, and scorpion bites. Partly chewed mescal buttons are packed around sore teeth to ease the pain and rubbed on the knees to enhance hiking ability. The women of several Great Plains tribes may consume several buttons three times during childbirth. Peyote tea is employed as an antiseptic wash for wounds and bruises and for soothing, aching limbs, in addition to its frequent use in ceremony. And this gets to another point, that hallucinogens may be very important for non-hallucinogenic purposes. There's a colleague of mine at the LSU Medical Center in my hometown of New Orleans who's looking at the treatment of asthma with very promising results from very small doses of hallucinogenic compounds. And the whole field of microdosing, which has really taken off like a rocket over the last couple of years, may be tied to this effect that it's not just the hallucinations which may have therapeutic implications. As further evidence of the medicinal value of peyote, Schultes noted that the common origin myths of peyote that focused on the consumption of peyote by a starving indigenous person to impart sustenance and strength in challenging circumstances. Notably, the Aztec word for peyote uh, is, is thought to mean woolly or maybe woolly medicine, which refers to the tufts on top of the cactus. Peyote is also perceived as a great medicine among the many different tribes outside of its original main that have adopted its use. In other words, <clears throat> even tribes that haven't been using peyote for thousands of years are using it for many uh, medicinal purposes. Though impressed by his kaleidoscopic peyote visions, Schultes quickly learned that cactus is viewed as a universal remedy by indigenous groups of the plains in northern Mexico. A Kickapoo colleague told him... Peyote was taken amongst indigenous peoples, quote, as a white man takes aspirin. 
other tribal contacts asserted that if peyote is used correctly, all other medicines are unnecessary. In fact, Schultes believed that the medicinal properties of peyote were the major reason that the little cactus was so widely consumed. Peyote is just one of 1,300 species of the cactus family, all of which are native to the New World. After his experiences on the plains of Oklahoma, Schulte strongly encouraged additional scientific study of the family, which he believed could yield new medicines. Quote, What should concern us is the advisability of intensive chemical and pharmacological investigations of the entire cactus family, especially the genera most closely related to peyote. There has never been a concerted screening of this family for potential medicinal properties. Though Schultes went on to attain his greatest fame later in documenting the use of magic mushrooms in Mexico and ayahuasca in the Amazon, he never forgot how he started his career on the peyote road. To the end of his days at Harvard, if you look very carefully on his desk, there was always a little peyote cactus growing in a little clay pot. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please remember to give us a good rating and to subscribe and share with like-minded folks. We appreciate your support for the protection of the knowledge and biodiversity of South America by the Amazon Conservation Team. In our next episode, Dr. Mark Plotkin will embark on the beginning of a two-part episode about a particularly notorious anise-flavored spirit, absinthe.